Lights Up audience over there on our Facebook and YouTube channels. My name is Teemu Arina. I'm the host of the Bikers live show tonight or today, wherever you are uh, tuning in. Uh, and I want to remind you that you can actually participate in everything that we discuss by using the hashtag Biohackers Live on Twitter and Instagram. We'll be following those hashtags. And you can also uh, comment and ask questions on the Facebook chat on the Biohackers Summit Facebook page and also the Biohackers Handbook Facebook page. And any questions that you make, we'll be monitoring on those and we'll be asking our guest tonight. And I would love to ask you to basically introduce yourself, where are you calling in and tuning in to this particular live show today. Today, our guest is Greg Potter. And the topic that we're going to be diving deep into is the ways how you could optimize your sleep and your diet and your metabolism. And I'll give an introduction about him just in a second. But uh, for the show notes, you can find more information at biohack.to slash Potter. You will find the weekly uh, research article that we dive deep into. You will find Seamland special report on sleep and diet and um, fasting, diet and fasting specifically today. And also there's a weekly app that you can download. But with that, Greg Potter, he is a pretty cool guy. I mean, he's a researcher, PhD at the University of Leeds, and his research has been focusing on sleep, diet, and metabolism. And he's not just you know some guy at, at a university doing some research, but his research has been featured in Reuters, The Time Magazine, The Washington Post, Fox News, USA Today, and many other media outlets. And... Uh, he holds uh, BSc and MSc degrees in exercise physiology, and uh, uh, the, as his day job, he actually works with Dan Party, who was our guest on optimizing your sleep a few episodes ago. And uh, Greg is working as a content director for HumanOS.me. So if you if you've been trying the HumanOS.me platform, which is great, you should. You ha- if you haven't, you can use the code uh, BLS. Uh, so like Biker's live show, uh, that's that's basically what you can get your hands on um, at humanos.me. You can use the code BLS and you can see a lot of content. And Greg, Greg is responsible for making some of that as well over there. And uh, yeah, he wants to really help people improve their health and performance. These are some of the values that li- he lives by and he's keen to educate uh, the general public about the importance of different health topics. And he's also one of our speakers at the Bakers Summit coming up in Stockholm on 18th of May. And I would hardly recommend you to check out the website, uh, www.biohackersummit.com and check out our Stockholm website. You can see the conference program over there. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming up, and most of the VIP tickets have already been sold. Uh, many of the side events are already gone, but there is Dr. Andrew Hill on neurofeedback. So if you've been looking into getting some neurofeedback training from the real experts and real specialists, there's a full-day workshop that you can take part in Stockholm. Dr. Andrew Hill is not very often in Europe, and uh, definitely this is one of the very rare opportunities to learn from the best of the best. So if you've been thinking about reprogramming your brain or you've been thinking about how uh, neurofeedback work, uh, you want to try it yourself or you want to train yourself also uh, to be able to provide these kind of services from for others, both of those kind of intermediate and beginner um, stages uh, are covered in that workshop. So Take a look at biohackersummit.com for more information on that. Um, but yeah, today's guest. Uh, let's let's dive deep into it in a second. <clears throat> so, Greg, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. I'm awesome. hearing sunny leads and yeah looking forward to this oh absolutely 
So how did you start your day? I mean, you've probably been already starting your day by thinking about uh, sleep tonight. Yeah, I started my day quite early. So I'm a very early chronotype. And yeah, I've got a quite specific pattern about how I go about things. So normally I just wake up and I normally meditate at the start of my day. Hmm. After that, I will see what I have planned for the week. So just to reevaluate my weekly goals and then see what I've got planned for today. Hmm. Shortly after that, I'll check my emails just to make sure that I can just crack on with what I had planned, make any changes. And then today after that, I've done some work for Human OS this morning and then a bit of preparation for this. And shortly after this, I'm going to head off to the gym and sling some iron. So good day. Sounds, sounds, sounds really amazing. What's in your mind in these days? So what, what are you focusing on uh, as we speak for, you know, around this week? Yeah, so the last few weeks I've been focusing on creating a course for human OS on how your body clock influences your metabolism in particular. And hopefully that will go up next week. So now that that's part, I have written a few blogs recently, but what I've been focusing on mostly is creating resources that help people improve their sleep. So something that we're very interested in is every way in which somebody can intervene to enhance certain aspects of their sleep with a view to improving some aspects of their life. So I've been reviewing the literature related to that and compiling information and then trying to come up with the best way to go about organizing it and creating something which is useful for everyone. I see. Um, you mentioned earlier the term chronotype. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, so chronotype is technically phase angle of entrainment. So it's the time of your circadian system relative to some sort of time cue in the environment. So as a researcher, for example, you might look at the lowest point of someone's core cool body temperature relative to dawn. And a more operational way to assess chronotype is just looking at someone's sleep timing. So there are various different tools that researchers will use to this end. Generally, they're questionnaires. So some of them are available online, actually. One is the MCTQ, the Munich Chronotype Questionnaire. And if anyone's interested to find out where their sleep timing falls on the population bell curve, they can go to the website wep.org and you just answer a series of questions related to your sleep patterns. And what they use is mid-sleep time. And that variable is adjusted for sleep depth because that will influence your mid-sleep time. And mm -hmm. then what you find out is, okay, I'm 28 years old and on average people at this age have the following mid-sleep time. So if they fall asleep at midnight and they wake up at 8 a.m., then their mid-sleep time would be 4 a.m. And you can find out if you're early or late relative to your peers. So the easiest way to think about it is just whether you're more of a morning lark or a night owl. Mm, I see. I've been using the new Aura Ring to kind of figure out better my patterns in behavior uh, in terms of sleep. And I'm definitely a sleep owl. So do I have any hope when it comes to longevity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some work published on that just a couple of weeks ago, which you might have seen. It was Kristen Knutson and, and Malcolm von Schantz, who's at the University of Surrey. And they did an epidemiology study of the UK using the Biobank, which is just a big government run program. And what they found is that night owls actually had slightly higher rates of mortality. And I wouldn't be too concerned if I were you, because what you need to consider is that if you're a night owl and you have to conform to social norms, then quite often what's going to happen is you're going to end up losing sleep because you still have to wake up to an alarm in the morning so that your day is synchronized with the rest of society. So the question is, in the future, can we tailor people's work schedules, for example, such that they're better suited to people's individual biology? And there have been some early research studies looking at what happens when you tweak shift work schedules according to people's chronotypes. And they seem to be promising so far. People tend to sleep better. Their self-reported quality of life is higher. So the question for you, I suppose, is how can you be a night owl and maintain that pattern while still getting enough sleep? Right. So 
when it comes to this northern hemisphere that I'm living in, basically in the summer, the sun sometimes never sets. And in the winter time, it's pitch black and the sun barely gets over the horizon. I mean, what, what does that do to my circadian rhythm and my chronotype? Yeah, so <laughs> it screws things up in short. But the question is, how can you intervene to make your light dark cycles more reminiscent of those at different latitudes? So somewhere near the equator, for example. And I think that what you'd want to focus on, as I'm sure you do, is minimizing your light exposure at night during the summer and then increasing the intensity of light you're exposed to during the day, during winter time. So there are various ways that you can go about that. If we look at the summer, for example, then what you want to focus on is things like using blackout blinds and perhaps you can use blue blockers, the glasses, yeah. and there are various of those available. But <clears throat> during the winter, on the other hand, the problem is that the lighting that we're exposed to indoors is often not only much less intense than the light that we're exposed to outside, but it's also a different spectrum. So if yeah. you look at intensity, intensity is just measured in units of lux. lux. Yeah, yeah sure. And, and one lux is just the amount that's emitted by a candle held one meter away. And outside on a sunny day at midday, you might get over 100,000 lux in the summer, but in a normally lit room, perhaps you'd be exposed to 5,000. And that's really important because the light dark cycle is the key time cue for the circadian system. So anyway, during the winter, if you can use things like smart lighting and perhaps light boxes, then you can recapitulate the kind of light that you'd be exposed to outside during the summer. And then fortunately at night, you're going to be exposed to darkness. So that should help you sleep well. Hmm. So what I definitely do, I have a daylight lamp on my desk and I use it on a, on a constant basis. And by the way, if anyone is up there is uh, following the stream you know comment on the chat what your typical kind of schedule is if you think you're a sleep owl or 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 early riser and if you do any kind of hacks in terms of a light exposure uh, throughout the day that would be cool to know but what i've noticed personally is when i travel when i go to closer to the equator where the sun sets and sun rises um at a pretty uh uh i mean very quickly compared to what what it happens here. Here it's a so, sort of a really slow, gradual um, demise when it comes to sunset and and sunrise as well. So then the question is like, when I'm there, I'm more likely to be a morning person. It it really kind of switches my clock into that kind of thing. I get sleepy already at six seven, and uh, uh, when I'm here it tends to kind of shift forward. So is, is that basically that I'm not doing my light exposure right? Yeah, so I didn't really answer part of your previous question, which is how does chronotype shift with season? And what seems to be the case is that when you're not exposed to such intense, they're called zeitgebers, it's the German word meaning time giver, but the main one is the light dark cycle. On average, people's circadian systems delay because if I were to take you down into an area which is sheltered, so if you went into a cave for a week, for example, and you had no idea what time it was outside, then your body clock wouldn't be exactly 24 hours. It would, all, it would normally be slightly longer than 24 hours. So with weaker time cues in the winter, namely not much light exposure, your circadian system tends to shift later. And in order to anchor that circadian system to the day, you need more light exposure. So for you, when you go near the equator, you're exposed to this much stronger time cue, and that keeps your clock better aligned with the environment. And there are various ways of showing this experimentally. Hmm. Another thing to mention is that if you look at different countries, then the actual dispersion of chronotypes differs quite a lot. Not only that, but the timing does too. So here in the UK, for example, you probably find that some people are relatively early birds, but there are lots and lots of night owls. They're not night owls relative to other people in the UK, but if we took those people and compared them to people in, let's say, India, on average, people in India would be much earlier types. 
and perhaps there'll be less variability between people in the time at which they go to sleep. So that all makes sense. And the question really is, first, do you want to shift your body clock timing? The answer for many people is probably yes, if it interferes with them getting enough sleep. And then second, how do you go about doing so? Mm. And really, it, it does come down primarily to lighting. But as I'm sure we'll get to, other things do set the time of different clocks in our body. So whereas the light-dark cycle is the key time cue for the master clock in the brain, the clocks in many of our peripheral tissues, so by that I just mean all the clocks outside of the master clock in the brain, are actually typically, it appears, primarily entrained by eating fasting cycles. Right. So if we go into eating and fasting cycles, uh, what I notice is also that the time when I eat tends to get a little bit later in, in, in these hemispheres. And um, so, so I wonder like what that might do to me as well. Like um, I like to eat in the morning. And one of the things that I know from science is if I'm crossing uh, these different time zones, sometimes it's a good idea to fast and eat in the destination the next morning, um, supposedly to help you kind of reset your uh, circadian uh, rhythm and, and the clock. So uh, what, what, what's your take on that? What's going on there? Yeah, so what's interesting is that if you look at the master clock in the brain, which is just these neurons in a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, then they respond to light, but they respond relatively slowly. So people forecast that on average, if you travel to a different time zone, then the master clock in your brain will adjust at about one hour a day. That hmm. said, the clocks in the periphery seem to adjust more quickly to meal timing. So certainly that's been shown in animals where within a relatively short period of time, if you completely invert the time at which an animal eats, then the clocks in their peripheral tissues can shift by as much as 12 hours, which is the most that they can physically shift within the constraints of the 24 hour day. Wow. And in humans, it's difficult to get at this because we can't accurately measure the timing of someone's master clock. I can't look at the individual neurons in your brain when they're firing and measure the timing of your suprachiasmatic nucleus. So for that reason, what we do is we look at surrogate measures of the timing of the master clock. And the principal ones that people measure are cortisol and melatonin. Melatonin is the least noisy thing to look at because whereas cortisol will be influenced quite a lot by things like exercise and stress, melatonin is quite robust as a phase marker. By phase, I just mean the timing of someone's body clock. Right. So just recently, there's been some work published looking at the effects of meal timing in humans. And it seems that perhaps we don't shift our peripheral clocks quite as much when we change the time at which we eat, but we certainly shift the timing of some of them. So that work was done by research at the University of Surrey last year. And what they did was they just changed the time at which people ate meals by five hours and they were crossed over between these two conditions. So in one condition, the people ate early and then in the other condition, they, they ate five hours later on average. And to measure the time of the circadian system, they looked at people's melatonin profiles and they found that the time at which they ate didn't shift those. But then they also looked at their blood glucose rhythms and the timing of what are called clock genes in adipocytes from the buttocks. And they found that the timing of those were shifted. So the, the glucose rhythm was actually shifted by the same amount that the meal timing was shifted, about five hours. And that suggests that the clocks in the peripheral tissues that regulate the timing of the blood glucose rhythm were shifted by about the same amount of meal timing. And then the clock gene timing in the fat cells was shifted by something closer to one hour. Wow. And just to, just to expand on that, clock genes are these molecular clocks that exist in practically all of our cells, not all of them, but almost all of them, every cell that has a nucleus. And they're important because they regulate the timing of incompatible metabolic processes in cells. So for example, a cell can't be building something and breaking down something at the same time. And what the clock gene feedback loop does is it creates these fluctuating levels of clock gene protein. And the clock gene proteins act as what are called transcription factors, which are just these little molecules that bind to 
the promoter regions in genes to regulate the timing of the expression of other genes. So in this way, they coordinate the timing of the cellular program in each of your cells. Hmm. Wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring in C. Land. I mean, I know he is very much into diet and nutrition and doing his keto stuff and fasting and all that. We're going to have a little chat on those things. And while I'm going to play this video, check that your uh, microphone source is the right one. Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's the right one. So good. Um, let's, let's bring that over. Food. One of the most important things for the survival of an organism. In nature, food is scarce and it's not always readily available. In society, food is abundant and it's everywhere we look. In wealthy countries, there's so much food that people literally have to come up with more ways of burning off those extra calories. Food is almost like society's obsession as it's a huge driver of business, population control, medicine and entertainment. Now. Put this organism that is evolutionarily programmed to eat as much food as possible into an environment that is overly abundant and you're going to end up with quite a lot of problems. Culture is so wired to eat that people think you're crazy if you skip breakfast or don't consume bread. What do you mean you're not going to eat today? Are you trying to starve yourself? Man, I'm not going to even start talking about fasting for 3 to 7 days then. This is perfectly natural. Humans have evolved under constant nutritional stress by going through fasting and feasting. In fact, it's such a big part of our physiology that missing out on this cycle can have negative side effects on your health. There are many health benefits to being in a fasted state, starting with improved biomarkers, reduced inflammation, anti-aging, fat burning, but it can also help you to mobilize some of the nutrients that are already stored in your body. The problem isn't lack of energy or lack of fuel, the problem is not getting access to that energy. In the modern environment, famines rarely happen and therefore we have to create our own periods of nutrient deprivation where we simply don't eat. This is an incredibly healthy and very sustainable eating practice that everyone can follow and they're going to see massive results from it. Intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating should be a part of any modern human as a way of not only optimizing your nutrition but also to not become dependent of this abundance that we all tend to take for granted. Wow, that's that's where Seam was really diving into the the ways how you can use fasting and something he mentioned as time-restricted eating uh, to, to influence your feeding patterns. Now, um, uh, Seam, are you over there? I'm over here. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool, man. So um, you're fasting quite a lot. So have you noticed any uh, any effects on your sleep quality when you do that? Uh yeah, definitely. Like, uh, I think fa fasting or time restricted eating is important when you when you when you combine it with you know the idea of like consuming small meals during the day all the time. Then they're practically never gonna enter into a fasted state either. Only like maybe like a few hours during the night. So that's, in my opinion, is like simply a matter of a mismatch in what our evolutionary uh, physiology has become adapted to and in the past we would have we would go through these periods of uh, fasting quite quite frequently and i believe like it's something that we tend to neglect especially in the modern world where we have food but when it comes to my sleep quality then uh, i do notice that uh, for instance when i'm fasting then uh, I don't f I don't feel the need to you know consume more energy during the day either, and uh, it's going to f facilitate a, a better night's sleep for me in mm. the evening because because yeah I'm, I'm more primed to to actually getting a good night's sleep and uh, falling asleep as well. Okay, so you went for like uh, several days of a fast recently, and the studies that I've looked into basically say that. If you don't have like food available, then your body kind of naturally keeps you more awake so that you can hunt and, right. and find that food. So, mm. so have you noticed anything like this, like loss of sleep quality in aura or anything when you went for this like three day fast or something like this? Uh, no, actually, actually, I actually slept better because of, uh, I, f I feel part of it had to do with uh, simply being more energy restricted in general to you know you you're of course you're gonna you know if you haven't eaten anything you're gonna feel slightly 
you know, confined in the sense still, you know, you're not going to have like that much explosive power. But at the same time, I feel like I slept better because of, you know, I was, I was simply so depleted and I was so kind of tired in the sense that uh, I didn't feel any disruption in my sleep quality. Hmm. Okay, let's let's bring Greg here. So, Greg, uh, what do you think about all of this? Yeah, I think it's very interesting, and people need to play with what works best for them. So, I certainly think that eating too close to bed is likely to impair sleep. There's another aspect to this beyond timing too, and that certain foods will influence sleep. Certain compounds in the diet will influence sleep. So, obvious ones are things like caffeine, and then also alcohol. But in addition to that, I think that over time, if you go through an extended fasting period, then what I would expect, as you pointed out, is that sleep would eventually fragment and that is adaptive. So you see that in various studies of animals, but there haven't been many studies of humans looking at the effects of prolonged fasting on sleep. But as you pointed out, I think that it would be evolutionarily advantageous for you to be more awake and more alert and more active during times of food restriction. And it makes sense mechanistically too. But with that said, I suppose that there are other facts at play too. So I think that you're on a keto diet, for example, and that generally has an appetite suppressing effect. And when you can suppress your appetite and go without food for a period of time, then perhaps that won't disrupt your sleep so much. Hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like eventually, you're of, of course, you're going to run into some sleep troubles, especially if you're already running on low on low body fat and you don't have even energy from your own adipose tissue either. So it's it's going to eventually lead to some sort of disruptions in sleep. But in general, like the first few days of uh, fasting, the, I, I, I think like there's not much uh, like decrease in sleep quality, I believe, in my experience as well. Yeah, and that's that's interesting because if you look at how sleep is regulated, then fasting might influence several mechanisms that contribute to good sleep. So, for example, if you go for a long period of time without food, then your levels of growth hormone are going to go up because the function of growth hormone principally is to effectively preserve your lean body mass while mobilizing your energy stores. People think about it as perhaps contributing to things like muscle growth, but it doesn't really do so. It's more anti-catabolic than it is anabolic. So Anyway, with fasting, growth hormone and ghrelin will go up. And growth hormone seems to be important to uh, deep sleep in particular. So that's one way by which it could contribute. And then there are other things too. So fasting, for example, might influence inflammation in your body and various inflammatory processes are implicated in sleep regulation too. And it depends on your starting point. So you might have someone who's very inflamed. You might have someone else who's not very inflamed and they might respond differently to fasting. So it's probably an instance where some people will actually experience improved sleep. On average, I think that most people would experience worse sleep with prolonged fasting. But as I mentioned, that work really hasn't been done to my knowledge. I have one question here coming from uh, the audience. Borg BC is asking, do you, do you guys know about Dr. Robert Kasser? C-A-S-S-A-R? Is, does it ring a bell? Not to me, I'm afraid. Sana Maria, you need to give me a little bit of context and we'll get back to that question. Now, getting into some of the ways how you can kind of uh, improve your sleep. Uh, 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 how do you pronounce this? Yeva Ripinskite? Okay. Anyway, so how can you hack the length of your sleep? So if you want to sleep a little bit longer, maybe you're waking up, I assume. Yeah. So to sleep longer, I think that most people will be waking for work or whatever in the morning. And for that reason, they'll need to go to bed earlier. And this isn't very sexy, but actually a lot of that comes down to the consistency of your pre-bed routine. So something that I'm a fan of is setting an alarm in advance of your bedtime rather than in the morning. So until you drill in the habit of going to bed at a consistent time, then I would set an alarm for the start of your pre-sleep routine. So let's say that you need to go to bed at 10 p.m. in order to get enough sleep for you to function optimally. Well, if your pre-sleep routine was an hour, for instance, then you might set that alarm for 9 p.m., at which point you would start that routine. And then over time, you'll ingrain that habit and it will be less of an issue. 
So that's one consideration, but there are many other things that you can do. And fundamentally trying to just go to sleep earlier might be misguided. The reason is that if you look at how sleep is regulated, then there are principally two processes that can be modeled to show how likely someone is to fall asleep. And those are just the circadian process, which influences wakefulness and the sleep process, which is intuitive. So the longer that you've been awake each day, the more sleepy that you get. And <clears throat> what happens is you wake up in the morning and the pressure to sleep is very low because you've paid off your sleep debt over the course of the previous evening. Over the course of the day, you're active. And the more energy that you expend, the more your pressure to sleep builds over the course of the day. To counter that and stop you from just falling asleep, the wake drive needs to increase and lockstep with that over the course of the day. Now, just before bedtime, the wake drive is at its highest in order to counter the increased sleep pressure. So some people call this the forbidden zone for, for sleep. And it just means that if you try to just fall asleep one hour earlier, you're probably, you're probably not going to do that. So what you want to do is you want to shift your circadian system earlier, which means getting lots of light exposure, particularly bright light exposure early in your day, and then minimizing your exposure to light and to blue light in particular late in the day. So that's one thing. The other thing to consider is that if you look at sleep pressure, then the main correlate of that is the, the level of extracellular adenosine in your brain. Mm. So you probably know ATP. ATP is the main energy currency of your cell. What you find is that as your brain is active, adenosine is, well, ATP is released from presynaptic neurons into the extracellular space. And that can then stimulate the production of cytokines, which are also sleep promoting. And then over the course of the day, what these do is they effectively disinhibit sleep promoting neurons in the brain and they inhibit wake promoting neurons. So anything that you can do to increase adenosine levels is going to increase your sleep propensity. And some ways to do that, obvious ones are caffeine because caffeine effectively inhibits adenosine from binding to its receptors. So cutting your caffeine intake should help you fall asleep earlier and get more sleep. And the research shows that. But then anything, broadly speaking, that increases your energy expenditure, particularly in your brain, is likely to increase your sleep pressure. And that's going to affect sleep depth and perhaps also sleep duration. So in this bracket would be things like exercise, but then also just cognitively taxing activity. So that can be even something like meditation, which requires lots of focus but it could be just working hard on a particular project. Other things include thermal stresses. Mm -hmm. So temperature, if you ramp up your body's temperature, metabolic activity increases in correspondence with that increase in temperature. So it seems that actually exposing yourself to higher temperatures too may help build sleep pressure over the course of the day. Ah, that might explain the reason why when I'm in also a warmer climate uh, near the equator, I just, you know, sleep more soundly. I go to sleep earlier because of the heat. So here in a colder climate, when I'm exposed to cold temperature, I'm more likely to stay awake. And uh, is, is that what's going on there? Yeah, there's another aspect to this too, beyond sleep pressure. So Temperature is very important in sleep regulation generally. And I'll have to just explain this briefly, but if you look at ectotherms, so reptiles, for example, they get their heat from the sun. And if you, if you look at their body temperature, then their skin temperature just moves in accordance with their body temperature each day. So during the daytime, they're getting more energy from the sun, their body temperature goes up, they can be active, they can go out and get some food. And then as the sun sets, their body temperature goes down. So they have this daily cycle of body temperature increasing and body temperature decreasing. Humans are endotherms, so we're not like that. And what's interesting is that actually, if you look at our core body temperature, then it's in counter phase with our skin temperature. So for you, let's say that your core body temperature peaks at 5 p.m. each day. That's probably the time at which you're going to be strongest, you're going to be most alert. So if you look at your physical performance, for example, then the rate at which enzymes in your muscles will be able to break down energy stores in order to fuel exercise will be at its highest. Nerve signals that cause muscle contractions will travel fast at that time of day. And 
around the time that you sleep, the fall and core body temperature is a very important way by which you can increase how likely you are to fall asleep. So how do you facilitate that? And actually, counterintuitively, you do so by raising your skin temperature at that time. So whereas the ectotherms, their body temperature goes up and their skin temperature goes up at the same time, ours goes down as the other goes up. So just to explain that, what you want to do is you want to effectively raise the skin temperature shortly before you go to bed. So there are various ways that you can do that. One is just having something like a warm shower. Hmm. You can have a warm bath. It seems to be important in particular to raise the temperature of your feet and your hands. So a high is, is, that, is, that, is that why there is a recommendation to use like socks or gloves or something like this or, or, or even take a really quick, quick sauna or, or just like shower, basically a warm shower just to make yourself cooler. Is that what's going on there? Yeah, it is. So the gradient between your core body temperature and your skin temperature facilitates heat loss. So you raise the skin temperature and you encourage more and more loss from your core. And the thing with your hands and your feet is that they're very rich with blood vessels called anastomoses, which just connect arteries to arteries, veins to veins and arteries to veins. But anyway, because of that and because those areas of your body also have a very large surface area with a small volume, you can very efficiently lose heat from them. So by keeping them nice and warm, you actually help your body lose heat and therefore improve your sleep. And regarding socks, there was a study that was just published actually, which looked at that and it found that when people wear socks, not only do they fall asleep faster, they actually sleep slightly longer too. So that's a, a really simple way by which you can improve your sleep. So the first thing would be having either a warm shower or a warm bath, perhaps within an hour or so of going to bed. And another is just keeping your socks on initially. It would actually kind of make sense to wear gloves too, but I'm not sure that many people will be willing to do that because it'd be a bit weird. Yeah. Just after having a having a nice evening with your lady, you're just going to put your socks on and fall asleep. I, li- I love that. So um, <laughs> I actually checked on Dr. Robert Kasser and, and he seems to be one of these kind of health influencers, YouTubers, pretty old looking guy, pretty rip uh, uh ripped also for his age and he describes himself as a solar powered radically driven health supernaturalist and lifestyle prototype enthusiast oh that was a mouthful but he's basically at Urter academy so i assume that these guys are talking about all these different natural ways of living and how how that affects your your health in so many different ways so um earthing what do you think about earthing like uh does that have any any role in terms of like improving sleep quality i'm not so familiar with that literature so i looked at that and the last time i looked at it was about seven years ago so it's far from fresh in my memory if i'm if i'm not mistaken then the idea is related to oxidative stress so by earthing yourself you encourage the dissipation of free radicals in your body And then that in some way would enhance sleep. And I think that the last time that I looked at this, it was a review paper. And the suggestion was that there there was a lot of preliminary evidence that it might do something, but the quality of the studies that have been published so far wasn't very high in general. So more work needed to be done. I'm I'm not aware of, of much ongoing research in the sleep research community on that particular subject. So... It, perhaps it's doing something, but I would focus more on things that are known to influence sleep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have also the same impression. I, I was one of the lead authors of the, the Barker's Handbook chapter on sleep. You can find more information at barkingbook.com on that one. And and we didn't really include earthing uh, in, in there uh, or focus much on it because, uh, as you said, the research is quite inconclusive and not very well um, uh, well, basically architected so far as, as I've seen. If if anyone you know watching this has better information, throw in. Um, but definitely, the way how I think about many of these things, like um, avoiding blue light or earthing and all these things, there is so much more effective ways to to deal with health concerns that goes into lowering inflammation and improving sleep quality. That um, 
I'm not too concerned about those. It's sort of like running around uh, and with blue light blocking glasses and avoiding electromagnetic frequencies, and then you go to McDonald's to eat. It's it's kind of like how I see it sometimes when people are get enthusiastic about these um, these 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 different quantum. Uh, dimensions of, of health education. So when you looked at the different studies when it comes to sleep quality and, and so on, like what would you say are the, mo- the, the interventions that have the highest efficacy of actually doing something when it comes to improving your uh, sleep quality? Yeah, so I'd probably break it down into different buckets. So light exposure is one of those. And I won't dwell on that because we've touched on it before, but what I'll just say is that think about perhaps using a mask during sleep to block out light if that's an issue. If you have someone in your bedroom, otherwise remove devices in your bedroom that emit blue light and download apps that will filter blue light from your devices too. So things like F.Lux. And, 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 when, and when would you do this like uh, prior to going to sleep? Yeah, I... I don't think there's any hard and fast rule. The nice thing with those apps is that actually they're done based on your location and the sunset and your location. I don't know how that looks in polar regions though. So you mentioned earlier that your summer yeah, pretty is crappy. eternal summer. Does that just mean that the blue light just stays up on the devices with those apps? I don't know. So anyway, you can personalize the settings. And I would say that perhaps if I was just going to pluck a number out of thin air in the 90 minutes or so before the time at which you plan to go to sleep, so light exposure, that's definitely one of them. Another is temperature. Mention that. One more thing there is that you want the temperature in your bedroom to actually be relatively cool and you want your bedding to be made of material which effectively dissipates heat. So there are various companies out there which produce bedding that fits that criterion. Other things, so regarding diet, caffeine's an obvious one. Alcohol, so alcohol it tends to actually reduce the amount of time people take to fall asleep and it will increase the amount of deep sleep that you get early in the night, but later in the night, your sleep will fragment and mm-hmm. that's not a good thing. So I would suggest probably no more than a couple of units, maybe four hours before bedtime. So cutting down on that is another simple one. Other things that you can do. So mention temperature earlier, getting your body temperature up during the day. That's one thing. Something that's quite interesting and relatively unexplored, and I don't really hear people speaking about this yet, is that it seems that brown fat thermogenesis actually has roles in sleep. So if, for example, you... So, 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 so brown uh, fat, basically BAT, uh, the brown adipose yeah. tissue that you build up when you expose yourself to cold temperatures. But yeah, exactly. Now so we're getting to the quantum level here. So babies are born with lots of metabolic metabolically active brown fat. Brown fat is like other fat, but it's dense with mitochondria and blood vessels. And what it does is it just throws off energy as heat. So you effectively burn more calories without actually putting them into building things. So if you can crank up your brown fat thermogenesis, then there's reason to believe that that will help with things like weight loss. Now, You can also increase brown fat thermogenesis through dietary means and through cold exposure, for example. So capsaicin in red peppers seems to be a brown fat activator. Cold exposure seems to be one too. And there's been work recently showing that if you restrict an animal's sleep, then their brown fat thermogenesis goes up. And that seems to be important to subsequent recovery sleep. So their ability to try and sleep more and more in the subsequent nights to repay their sleep debt. Because if you block that process, then they don't show that recovery sleep. So during the day, if you want to try and increase brown fat thermogenesis, then cold exposure, and by that I mean actual cold exposure, would seem to make sense in some ways, although that right now is quite speculative. Right on. So I guess there is still some some credibility to all these quantum health people. uh, the they are definitely pioneers uh, in in terms of kind of trying to discover all these electromagnetic and uh, uh, ways how our bodies are affected by our surroundings and how that ties back to our health and sleep quality and and all that. So uh, when it comes to supplements, uh, Beav Nurse is asking on the chat, uh, uh, actually mentioning, I don't know if it's she or he, basically. 
talking about cod liver oil. Uh, that's one of one that uh, one that she's taking, and then there's magnesium before bed. I don't know if Seamland is still over there. Uh, if you're still over there, you know you can also jump in and give some tips on more the nutritional interventions. But Greg, what what's your take on taking magnesium, taking taking different supplements before going to sleep to enhance your sleep quality? Sure. So I think that magnesium is probably one of the better ones and different types of magnesium will be more effective than others. The best one, the one with most evidence is probably magnesium citrate. And I would probably start with 200 milligrams of that. So magnesium seems to be involved in GABAergic signaling, and that's just a sleep promoting neuromodulator in the brain, but also brain magnesium levels go up during sleep. And that seems to influence how responsive the brain is to excitatory stimuli. So hmm. I think that's quite a good place to start, actually. 200 milligrams of magnesium citrate an hour or so yeah. before bed. Other things, DHA, cod liver oil, EPA. So if someone was very inflamed and they had uh, an omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, which was quite out of whack, then that can make sense. There's not much evidence showing that it directly influences sleep. But there mm. is for some other supplements. So in yeah. my mind, the strongest, the strongest ones would be L-glycine, three grams of that about an hour or so before bed, because glycinergic signaling is important to sleep, in particular to REM sleep. I'm taking a magnesium glycinate. Is that something you would go for to get more glycine also in the process? Yeah, so you can have bi or triglycinates, which is just binding minerals to glycine. And people sometimes do that with either magnesium and or zinc. And that makes sense because by binding it to glycine, you actually improve the uptake of the minerals. So whereas normally it might be 20% that's taken up by the gut in a triglycinate or a biglycinate situation, that number will be a bit higher. So that makes lots of sense. I also take basically this uh, complex from Puhdistama Finis, like superfood and... Uh... Uh, basically biohacking brand and and they have uh, magnesium glycinate they also have uh i think it's um bind into taurine uh what's your what's your take on taurine taurine i'm not so sure about so taurine i haven't looked at recently but i was looking at it a few months ago and i didn't find the evidence very compelling i don't recall the mechanisms off the top of my head though but I put it quite low down the pecking order. Yeah, T taurate. Yeah, magnesium taurate. That would be the one that I take. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. So the the forms that I've looked at mostly are citrate because citrate seems to have the most evidence regarding sleep specifically. I think that in a glycinate chelation that makes lots of sense. Another form that's interesting is is three and eight. Hmm. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, because that seems to better cross the blood brain barrier. But there haven't been many studies in humans of that yet. But I know that some nootropics companies, for example, are including that in their stacks for that reason. Because yeah. if, it, if it better enters the brain, then perhaps the nootropic effects will be enhanced accordingly. The third one that's in there is magnesium malate. So it's binding the malic acid. What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I, I think that I would probably start with citrate just because the yeah. studies that have looked at sleep specifically have used citrate gotcha yeah yeah so with citrate i get some more more likely to get some gut issues from it so i've been yeah. I've, I've been really digging this one so so definitely that's one thing uh i i, I don't know if seam land is still there but i would love to hear his take on this but some other things that i found really useful is uh, there is this Pukka Nighttime. It's basically a supplement that combines the, the main ingredients in there are valerian root, and then there is ashwagandha. And uh, there's a bunch of other things that also go into that particular supplement. But in my experience, it really helps with sleep onset. Interesting. So valerian, I think, of all of the hypnotic plants, the plants that people take as supplements to help them sleep, probably has the most evidence, the most studies have been done on it. And the results generally show that if you take, I think 300 to 600 milligrams of valerian, then subjective sleep quality tends to improve. So people will just report sleeping better. There have been many studies that have looked at polysomnography, so electrophysiological records of what's happening and more objective measures of sleep. But 
that's something to go by. So I think that that makes sense for many people. Ashwagandha, obviously it's popular at the moment as an adaptogen. And for somebody who is experiencing stress or something like that, then I would definitely see that as a good option to pursue. Other things that would fall into that category would be things like L-theanine. And I didn't mention this earlier, but stress is obviously a huge component of how well you sleep. Yeah, so absolutely. More, more broadly speaking, interventions to address stress are going to be really useful. And yeah. falling into that category would be things like meditation, progressive muscle relaxation. And then there are also some more novel techniques now that are becoming available too. Hmm. I've also used uh, some nutritional interventions like phosphatidylserin for lowering cortisol. And that seems to work for me, especially if I take it early in the day. Uh, so Siem, are, are you over there? And uh, what's your kind of uh, uh, take on supplementation and uh, sleep quality? Yeah, I'm still here. And yeah. uh, definitely uh, all, most of the supplements that you mentioned already, I've, I've used and I've seen like yeah, the connection, connection is lagging a little bit. Sorry, Sim, we can't really hear you fully. Um, so there's a, there's an issue with the line. If it's in my sleep, uh, from the, even like, is it any better now? Yeah, it's it's basically catching up. Try again. Let's try this or All right. we'll go forward. Yeah, now I can hear it pretty well. Okay. Long. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, basically like valerian root, ashwagandha, uh, things like that, and even like herbal teas, camo oil, and uh, the, those things are very soothing in the sense, in my experience, they're gonna relax me. The idea is to yeah, put yourself into a very parasympathetic state to not get wired up, whether they're by eating too much or spiking insulin and stuff like that. So mm. that's that's one of the go-tos. What I also use is like um, on days when I feel maybe like if I do get, if I do feel slightly wired up because of an, some sort of an unpredictable event or something like that, then I, I can also take like some sort of easy GABA supplement, which I found to be quite effective in inducing calmness and uh, lowering like these excitatory neurons. Uh, but uh, I'm not using it all the time because yeah, I don't want to become dependent on it. I, and uh, I, yeah. in, what I also found is that uh, if if I if I take like a very sh small shot of apple cider vinegar with some with some warm water or lemon juice, then it can also help me to sleep better. And uh, what I also noticed is that when I do it, and you know studies also show that uh, apple cider vinegar in the evening is going to lower the uh, blood sugar levels in the morning and it's going to prevent like a uh, cortisol spike or it's gonna at least lower it in the morning. Well, that was good that you brought it up. I almost forgot about that one. So you can take a little bit of apple cider vinegar and it definitely helps yeah. with blood sugar control uh, by affecting the uh, gluconeogenesis in the liver. So, um, Greg, what's your take on using GABA supplements? What's your take on maybe having a glass of alcohol to affect the GABA also? And uh, uh, yeah, apple cider vinegar. So thank you, Sim. Yeah, so I think you made a really astute comment about GABA and tolerance. So we don't really know this about GABA supplements yet because there just haven't, haven't been that many studies on it. But GABAergic drugs, which have been quite widely prescribed for sleep, do lead to tolerance over time. So people end up taking more and more of them. And then also when they come off them, they can experience withdrawal effects such that their subsequent sleep is impaired thereafter. So mechanistically that would make sense and i generally don't recommend gaba supplements for that reason in part the other reason is just that there haven't been many studies on it but it does also make sense that if you take gaba it will help you fall asleep because of the importance of the gaba system mm. in regulating sleep uh, uh, inside of vinegar yeah that's that's interesting and i've never looked at that but i i agree that doing something to help you improve your blood sugar regulation overnight is going to help reduce the likelihood of hormones that are involved in mobilizing sugar from various stores in your body of spiking at that time. So other things that you can do there would be things like taking cinnamon, which should theoretically have the same effect. So that makes sense. 
And then alcohol, as I alluded to earlier, it will help you fall asleep faster. And obviously it's just a big part of many people's lives and they like a glass of wine with dinner or whatever. And I'm not going to say never drink or anything like that, of course. I think that I would just try to consume it a little bit earlier if you feel that it interferes with your sleep and I would cap the total amount. So broadly speaking, maybe a couple of units, which is a beer or a medium glass of wine, no later than about four hours before sleep, but that's not a hard and fast rule because everyone differs so much in terms of how rapidly they process or detoxify what are called xenobiotics, which is just foreign chemicals like drugs. Mm, super interesting. I'm actually pretty surprised that we haven't brought up yet the use of a supplement that is very abundant for people who have sleep issues or who want to fall asleep earlier, and that's melatonin. What's your take on melatonin supplementation? Yeah, so melatonin is really interesting because whereas with many other drugs, because that's what melatonin is, hormones that you'll take exogenously, if you take them, then your body will stop synthesizing as much of that hormone itself. Oh, shit. So, <laughs> so with testosterone, for example, someone starts taking steroids, then all of a sudden their natural production of testosterone shuts down. Melatonin doesn't really seem to be like that so much. And there don't really seem to be, there doesn't really seem to be much tolerance to it or withdrawal effects either. So I have not many reservations in terms of recommending melatonin. Hmm. What, I, what I'll say is that the melatonin supplements seem to be improving because if you take regular melatonin, then it has quite a short half-life. So the half-life is just the time that it takes for the peak concentration mm. of melatonin in your system to reach half the peak levels. So that's why people, people take like huge amounts so that they can help that last longer. And now we have, I guess, some time release versions. Yeah, exactly. So as you said, the higher the dose, the longer the half-life. And now you have time release versions. So you both have slow release formulas. And you also have ones where on the outside of the encapsulation, you have a fast release melatonin and then inside there'll be a slow release. So what they're trying to do is better mimic your body's own internal uh -huh. synthesis of melatonin over the course of the night. So yeah. that makes sense. My suspicion with melatonin, and I did some work on melatonin as part of my PhD, is that it's probably very well suited to some people and not so much to others. And that probably depends on melatonin receptor genetics so humans have two melatonin receptors they're encoded by genes named mtn r1a and mtn r1b and there's a common variant of the mtn r1b gene which seems to quite strongly influence people's responses to melatonin and it's what's called a gain of function phenotype so the effects of melatonin in those people seem to be amplified so melatonin, if you look at its roles in metabolism, for example, it seems to inhibit glu glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. So if you had a high-carbohydrate meal and then took melatonin, then your blood sugar would spike much more than it would do otherwise. And in people with that particular melatonin receptor gene variant, that's going to be accentuated. So I, I think that some people will probably benefit from melatonin and the general effect on sleep is to help people fall asleep faster. It doesn't have many other effects, it seems. The slow release forms seem to be well suited to sleep maintenance insomnia. So people who just wake up in the middle of the night. But as I alluded to, some people will probably benefit quite a lot from it and other people might actually experience detrimental consequences. We don't really mm. know that for sure yet, but certainly that seems to be the case Right. In terms of metabolic function so far. Yeah, to me it sounds that if you take this slow release version, you have to be really careful about the dosage because if you start taking more, thinking that more is better and might help you to sleep if you have sleeping issues, then you can really mess up your uh, your your blood sugar control because the pancreas also has melatonin receptors there and uh, that that deals with the insulin release. So there's many things that this kind of factors into, and then there's people who have this specific gene that makes them more likely to be sensitive to the effects of melatonin, uh, what I discovered. So I, I would definitely start as low as possible and go up with the dosage, and and when I get the result, then back up a little bit. And uh, definitely if you're young, you don't need that. When you age, 
get some calcification on parts of the brain that kind of release this, probably then uh, melatonin could be one way to extend your nightly sleep. And I'm definitely looking into those uh, slow release versions. But I wonder about the toxicity with, I mean, if you look at the niacin, for example, they kind of now put a warning on on using niacin supplements that are slow release versions uh, that kind of avoid this flush reaction because you can more easily then build up levels that are, yeah, really not very good uh, for for your function um, uh, downstream. So, uh, yeah, let's let's move from move on from melatonin and let's look at more about the dietary thing and maybe even blood sugar control and so on. I'm gonna jump uh, and throw the weekly research article into this and, and let's let's take a look at that one. So the research article of the week uh, is uh, published in uh, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism 2016. The effects of the internal circadian rhythm and circadian misalignment on glucose tolerance and in chronic shift workers. So they studied chronic shift workers, uh, just like me, I guess. Um, uh, so this was Morris and, and others who, who published this work. Uh, so if you look at in the US, almost 15% of workforce undertakes shift work. Epidemiological studies indicate that shift work is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Shift workers frequently undergo circadian misalignment, such as light, dark, wake, sleep, activity, inactivity, and feeding, fasting cycles. And what they did in this study, they did a randomized crossover study with two three-day laboratory visits. One protocol included a simulated day shift and the other a simulated night shift. And nine healthy chronic shift workers who had five or more night shift per month were involved. Their diets were equalized, consisting 45% carbs, 35% fat, and rest protein. And they measure, measured glucose insulin responses uh, to identical meals given at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. in pro, both protocols. And the results, what did, what did we see? Now, now looking at the uh, misalignment protocol and alignment protocol, you can see how uh, melatonin... Uh, is, is affected um, here um, in, in this chart specifically. And uh, the, the peak concentrations, as you can see, it increases when the evening goes along. But now let's look at the glucose tolerance and insulin release. So uh, there is the morning uh, breakfast spike, and then there's the dinner, dinner spike. And uh, seems like the, the aligned... Uh, persons, they had better response in terms of insulin for breakfast and lower response in the evening. Uh, so it seems like those guys who were misaligned when they had breakfast, they they uh, they didn't release insulin as as effectively for for that breakfast part. So glucose after meal was six point five percent higher. Uh, at 8 p.m. than 8 a.m. Glucose tolerance was lower at dinner time, breakfast time, and late phase postprandial insulin was 18% higher at dinner time than breakfast time, suggesting decreased insulin sensitivity at dinner time. Now, uh, it, it seems like what we see here is a link to uh, type 2 diabetes risk in those who decide uh, to to live that kind of lifestyle. And uh, that definitely seems like if they eat on a regular kind of pattern that normally people do, they should probably rethink when they eat and how they do that. So so what's your take on this, Greg? Yeah, so I, I haven't read the, the full text, but I suppose that the key takeaways are when they're misaligned, glucose tolerance is worse in the evening. And when they're misaligned, they produce insulin less effectively early in the day. So both of those are going to impair glucose homeostasis. And there are probably several reasons why that might be the case. So one of the reasons might be that the clocks that exist in the pancreas themselves are disrupted for when you disrupt those clocks, it seems to be that various aspects of glucose metabolism are impaired. Another reason could be that cortisol and melatonin rhythms are 
out of phase with some of the other clocks in the body. And as I mentioned, melatonin inhibits glucose stimulated insulin secretion. So that could influence the results. And then cortisol also is important in setting the timing of clocks in your body because many of the clocks have what are called glucocorticoid response elements, which just means that they respond to it. So it helps orchestrate their timing. So the, the principal takeaways really are that, yes, there's reason to believe that this kind of circadian misalignment will impair glucose metabolism. Not only that, but because they looked at shift workers, what it means is that shift workers don't seem to adapt to circadian misalignment. So a long-standing question has been, okay, can shift workers get used to shift work? Do their bodies adapt to it in some way? And these findings probably suggest that they don't. They still suffer the impairments that the rest of us suffer. And then one, one more consideration is that the people in the shift work group slept less when they were misaligned, which makes sense because you're just trying to sleep at the wrong circadian phase. So if I try to fall asleep at two o'clock this afternoon, then there's no way that it's going to happen. Mm. Obviously, partly because I'm so excited to speak to you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Regardless of the day, that's not going to happen. So for that reason, they slept less. And when you shorten someone's mm. sleep, you're going to impair their glucose metabolism more so. So it's probably a double prong combination of both circadian misalignment and insufficient sleep too. So basically, if you want to give yourself diabetes, you don't sleep enough and you are eating at night at the wrong time. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, that doesn't sound very good. Um, now there is some recent studies that looked into time-restricted eating where they restrict basically the same amount of calories for uh, uh, to, be, to be consumed during the time when the sun is up. So basically, if I remember correctly, they had this study where they had had lab animals uh, and uh, they had exactly the same amount of calories, exactly the same food, but the only difference was when they were able to consume it. So the other group could consume it at any time. Uh, and the other group could only consume it uh, during a specific window. And it seemed that uh, when it comes to uh, diabetes risk and, and a bunch of other things and inflammatory biomarkers and so on, th those all went up in the group that could eat just about any time. So uh, what does that tell us about um, that aspect? And also, I mean, the abundance and availability of food. You can go in the middle of the night to a supermarket and, you know, you have a fridge there's a bunch of things that you can deal with to make sure that you're feeding yourself on a constant basis. Yeah, it means that you want to eat at the right time and you're going to have to be strict with yourself and make it easy to eat at the right time. So making sure that your food environment is conducive to you making good choices. But there are several aspects to this. So I think that the study that you're alluding to is a study that was headed up by Fred Churik's group. And there have been a few studies that are similar since, so others by Bray and a few others too. But what you find is that, as you said, if you give rodents the same amount of calories during their biological night times versus during their biological day times, they get fatter. But also there are other consequences too. So various other metabolic functions get worse when they feed at the wrong time. Hmm. The reason for this is that if you look at your circadian system, then what it does is it effectively programs your body to perform certain functions optimally at certain times of day. So it helps you adapt to the world outside you, but it also helps anticipate what's coming up ahead. So an example of anticipatory physiology is your cortisol alerting response each morning, which just increases your blood pressure, increases alertness, mobilize your energy stores, but then also in terms of adaptation, obviously change in light exposure will help you resynchronize your body clock to the outside world. So with all of that said, the implication of this is that first, your body is definitely going to process things better at certain times of day. And that's going to be your biological daytime. So the best marker of that is probably the amount of melatonin in your bloodstream. And there are other things to look at too. So one of them is energy expenditure. So you probably want to align when you eat with when you're more physically active, because what that's going to do is that's going to better direct the nutrients that you consume into the bodily stores where you want them. So for example, if you just exercise and you eat some carbohydrate, then the carbohydrates that you eat are more likely to be stored as muscle glycogen. 
So that's mm. just a, a facile example of that. So, regarding- so, so would you would you, for example, do something like exercise in the morning and then eat your breakfast? So you you could do that. Are you saying that eating breakfast too early would be misguided because it's still your night time effectively? Yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is that uh, when it comes to uh, training your body to, I mean, I, I know that GLUT4 uh, receptors yeah. are kind of key here to activate. So to make sure that this stuff gets in, uh, shuffled into, uh, in, into muscle growth. So would you, would you kind of exercise in the morning or maybe an hour after uh, do some jogging or something, run to the work or something to make sure that you are enhancing your glucose metabolism? And basically, you know, helping your body to get to the rhythm where it's supposed to be consuming all these, uh, all these incoming nutrients. Sure. So I'll just address this in two different ways. So one is just broadly in terms of metabolic health. There's lots of work now on inactivity physiology. So how being too sedentary influences metabolic risk, your risk of developing obesity and diabetes and all these different things. And what that research broadly shows is that you're much better off punctuating your day with physical activity, short periods of being active, preferably outside because being outside is going to help you synchronize your body clock. But then another consideration is, well, if you're trying to optimize your exercise performance, then because your circadian system influences things like your body temperature, you're going to perform better at certain times of day. So if you wanted to go into the gym, for example, and you wanted to set a personal best, then you're probably best going in your biological afternoon. So for most people, that's probably going to be around 5 p.m. You're going to be stronger at that time. And then another thing would just be, okay, how, how does this practically look? And if my metabolism is effectively working slightly less effectively at certain times of day, are there ways in which I can counter the effects of eating? So for example, let's say you have to wake up earlier than you would want to and you feel the need to force down a breakfast well if you were gonna do a little bit of low intensity activity at that time then that would probably help improve your responses to that meal right okay so um we're getting close to the end of this and uh i mean i already know this episode has been packed with so much information so thank you so much greg for you know diving us deeper into but let's let's take a look at a little app if people are interested in kind of getting themselves familiar with fasting and its effects on sleep quality maybe they can replicate something that seem has been doing maybe they want to try you know eating only during light hours and so on and uh, there is definitely good benefits of doing that just you know an experiment like that from the standpoint of, uh, uh, of, of just dealing with glucose metabolism and giving a break to your system tends to lower fasting glucose uh, levels and improve insulin signaling. So uh, there is one app that I discovered that is, is actually pretty cool uh, for, for doing something like this. And, and let's take a look at that one. So Zero uh, is, is an app by Kevin Rose. And this is amazing. Uh, here, here we go. I can, I can show it now. So let's take a look at that one. So when you open up Zero and you go to the settings, in settings, you can choose your fasting type. Uh, and you can choose one of these uh, studied fasting patterns. So the first one is the 16-hour intermittent fast. So if you want to go and do some intermittent fasting, this is pretty cool. And then there is the 13-hour circadian rhythm fast. And this is basically what we are talking about as time-restricted eating. And uh, if, I, if I choose, for example, the 13-hour circadian rhythm fast, and uh, here we go. It's actually the sun here in Helsinki. It's, it's, it's not setting yet, but in a few hours, I could press basically start fasting. And when I press on that one, it basically starts a timer. And I can come back to the app anytime and check when it's time for me to 
eat again. And as you do this, you can kind of start quantifying your fast, how long you fasted, and you can start to also then better understand the trends. And it kind of gamifies your, uh, uh, your fasting protocols with, with something that gives you, uh, gives you a good idea about how often you do it and uh, reminds you how to do it and you can keep a track on it. So then you get basically some numbers of how many, how many hours you've been fasting. And you can also read some of the science it's available here in the learn more settings. And um, there's also another pretty cool app that Kevin Rose has built, which is Oak. It's basically a meditation app. And uh, this one is super simple. Uh, so you may want to also check on this one. So you can do some simple breathing techniques. You can do like box breathing, you can deep calm. Um, you can boost your alertness with some some. Uh, more heavier techniques, and and then there's simple meditation. Uh, you can, you can with, begin. You can be with some with some sounds coming in from there, and uh, uh, some 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 very simple ways. And when you do this, your tree starts growing. So mine is still pretty young plant, but if we do this on a regular basis, it will grow into a, a full blown oak tree. So, Greg, have you uh, have you tried any of these things yourself? I haven't used the app. I do regularly practice time restricted eating. So for me, I'm trying to pretty much maintain my body weight. So I keep my eating period to about 12 hours each day, normally between about 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Okay. So when you do this, um, uh, the first question that probably comes to mind for many people is like, don't you get hungry? What if you, you know, can't fall asleep because you're so goddamn hungry? So what's that for you? What's your experience? <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't suffer from hunger too much. I, I very rarely actually get hungry. And it's probably partly because of my food choices. Hmm. And that's relevant because if you're trying to get used to fasting and you're, you're trying to do so after eating a bunch of processed food, then you're really shooting yourself in the foot because it's going to be so hard to sustain. But if you eat very filling foods, so things like, let's say that you're eating potatoes if you're having a carb source, or you're eating lots of meat and fish and cheese, lots of leafy green vegetables, that kind of thing. Things that are relatively rich in micronutrients, but sparse in macronutrients, then you're going to have a much easier time. So I've never found it to interfere with my sleep. I've actually found that because I stop eating probably three hours or so before I go to bed, I tend to sleep better. And I've got that consistency too, which I, which I think is useful. So problem with eating too close to bed is that when you eat your body temperature goes up for a period of time afterwards as you have to digest and break down those mm. nutrients so if your body temperature goes up then that's going to interfere with your ability to fall asleep so anyway i think that for most people it's probably actually going to help with sleep there might be an adaptation period because particularly with gut hormones so some hormones that you have in your body that are involved in appetite regulation respond quickly to your eating patterns. So ghrelin is one of these. So if you're mm. used to eating at certain times of day, then you effectively program the extrinsic cells which produce ghrelin to be active at those times. You switch your meal patterns and initially you'll be hungry at the times at which you used to eat, but quite soon you'll adapt to that. So I think that for a lot of people, there'll just be a period in which they might find it a little bit tricky. And then once they get past that, if they are consuming appropriate foods, so filling food, particularly foods rich in fiber and protein, then they probably won't really have any issues with it. Right. Uh, fascinating, fascinating, absolutely fascinating stuff, Greg. Oh my goodness. Uh, this turned out to be one of the best lessons of, of sleep and how to improve that and everything that goes in terms of all the biochemistry and metabolism behind that. So, so Greg has published a bunch of articles on these things. Um, I'm going to link uh, to his research articles also in the show notes. And uh, Greg, thank you so much for coming uh, online uh, to talk about sleep and diet and metabolism. And I'm really looking forward to your talk at the upcoming Biohackers Summit in Stockholm. That's going to be 18th of May. And uh, what do you think you're going to be diving deeper in there? Yeah, so I'm going to focus on sleep generally, but basically all the things that you can do to improve your sleep will be the focus of the talk. So I just want to give people practical things that they can go away and try 
in their pursuit of better sleep. And thank you very much, Dane. We've had a great time. Absolutely. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, that was deeply insightful. Thank you so much, Greg. And uh, with that, I mean, looking, looking into the future, uh, we're going to have some really cool episodes coming up also. Uh, next week, there's going to be regular episodes, and this will continue. If you have any questions, you can always join in on uh, one of our live, live streams uh, by taking part in the chat, also in the recording. I mean, you can just like post a comment uh, on any of those videos, and we will respond, and uh, Greg will keep an eye on that. And Biohackers Live, that's the hashtag you, you want to follow if you want to, you want to kind of follow what's going on here. You can find the show notes at biac.to slash potter. And um, when it comes to, you know, uh, what's coming next uh, and how you can follow on, um, if you go to bikersummit.com, you can actually find the, the Bikers podcast. You can find the podcast from the menu. Uh, there you can see our previous episodes. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes. And what, what else? You can actually speak your voice. You can leave a voice comment. You can leave a voice note and speak pipe there, and uh, we will feature you in any of those future episodes. Anything, any questions about biohacking, throw it in, and we'll start featuring those questions in our shows. So with that, thank you so much, Greg Potter, once again for joining. And you can follow us uh, on Facebook and YouTube, Biker's Summit, also Biker's Handbook. And uh, I wish you all a pretty damn good sleep this week. And I'm definitely going to take everything that I got from this superb interview and, uh, you know, try to improve my sleeping patterns, try to improve my circadian rhythm and uh, somehow cope being here in the Nordic, uh, Northern uh, region. So have an extremely sound, good sleep tonight. <laughs>